Today, we're questioning the impossible. Can the arts and cultural work, can they transform violent and protracted conflict? There are many people around the world that question this and question our work often. I'm going to let you answer this question for yourself by the end of my presentation. I begin with a story, a story from this land. We speak of it as Turtle Island. You probably know of it as the United States. In California, in the 1880s, there was an increasing influx of both settlers and gold miners seizing land in violent ways. It's probably the one place in the United States where everyone agrees it was genocide against the Native Americans. The genocide against one particular nation was so powerful there was only a very small band left of Miwok. And a group of vigilantes, posse, sent out and said, we're going to wipe out the last of those Miwoks. And you know what? That's going to be the end of our Indian problem. We won't have any competition over the resources or the land. So they rode out. And they cornered the Miwok on a piece of land where there was no escape, steep cliffs falling away. And the Miwok realized it was their end. And they asked first, before you fire, would you please allow us to sing a song? And this song was a sacred song known amongst all the Miwok for its power to affect change. For some reason, the posse agreed. The Miwok began to sing. And as they sang, one by one, the members of this posse put down their guns, turned, and rode away. The descendants of these surviving Miwok live today, telling this story, sharing it with physicist F. David Peet, who wrote about it in his book, Blackfoot Physics, a very powerful example of the ways in which ritual and music can transform conflict. This story does not stand alone. We have ample evidence from our research that the arts and cultural work can transform violent, protracted, long-term conflicts. Cynthia Cohen, Roberto Varela, and I are editors of a two-volume anthology on the specific art, on performance, ritual, ceremony, and theater, and how they transform conflict. We looked at case studies from all around the world, and we found there are a range of things that these performances do exceptionally well. They facilitate the expression of suppressed stories thoughts, and feelings. They restore capacities that people have lost through violence. They enact the moral imagination in relationship to issues of justice. And I will share with you some practice stories that illustrate these and other principles. Quite often, I'm asked, well, Really, these seem kind of small. Really, what one song by the Miwok or one performance by some Aborigines in Brisbane, can that really make a difference? But linked up with other actions, linked up with other forms of conflict transformation, they become powerful differences. We can understand their power more better if we look at them through a systems theory lens. Peter Coleman works with systems theory and conflict transformation. He says there are a range of things that we need to do to transform intractable conflicts. I'm going to talk about four of them today. One, increasing the complexity of information. Two, restoring multidimensionality. Three, privileging emotions. And four, disrupting feedback loops for violent conflict. In this case study, this is the Mile Creek Massacre Memorial in New South Wales, Australia. And I think it's a particularly strong case study to show how increasing the complexity of information into a protracted conflict can shift it. This ceremony is about a group of Aboriginal men, women, and children who were massacred by Australian stockmen in 1838. They took advantage of all the warriors being away, and they came into the village where the young women, young men, children, old men and women were. And they led them all along a road, a long, long road to the top of a hill, pushed them over the top of the hill and shot them all. And then in an attempt to hide their atrocity, they burned them. Now, people now living in this area, both white settler Australians, immigrants, and Aboriginal Australians, were not content to let that history lie as it did. 
They said, we know that what happened that day makes a difference in the lives of Aboriginal people today. We're not going to let things remain as simple as, well, that happened. It was a long time ago. One of, the, one of the explanations in Australia for this conflict is frequently, well, if, if we hadn't done it to the Aboriginal people, somebody else would have come in and done it to them. It was inevitable. Another very simple story that's told about this very complex situation is, well, you know, there weren't really any Aboriginal people around here. If there were, they just got up and ran away when the settlers came. This memorial complexifies those very oversimplified stories. And it does it in two ways. People experience this history in a range of modalities. They don't just hear about it in a lecture or read about it in a textbook or talk about it in a classroom. They embody it. They embody it as they walk up that road that those Aboriginal people walked all those many years ago. And the participants in this ceremony imagine what it must have been like for those little children for those old men and women, knowing where they were being led and what was going to happen to them. When they get to the top of the hill, you see here, they are cleansed with both an ancient and a contemporary Aboriginal ritual of walking through the smoke of eucalyptus leaves. Again, multi-sensory. They're learning with their bodies. They're learning through what they smell. And then they hear this much more complex history of what happened in Australia, and particularly what happened here at Myall Creek. There are stones all along the way to the memorial massacre site, and at each of these stones, there's a plaque that explains the history of what happened on that day. And at each of those plaques during the ceremony, there's a young Aboriginal person and a young white Australian person, and they read aloud. They testify to what happened in that place and at that time. So people come away. This is much more complex than what we thought had happened. And we realize now that what happened there is still affecting people to this day. And as a result of that, they become involved together in a range of justice initiatives. A group called the Friends of Myall Creek is very active in the New South Wales Parliament. And they've been instrumental in instigating a range of measures of justice for setting aside this land as a, nat as a national historical site, which can never be taken away from the Aboriginal people from these plaques and the memorials taking place there. There are also a number of other social justice initiatives, an educational initiative right now for people to learn that the massacres all around Australia didn't end on that day in 1838. They went underground because those stockmen were tried. And the last known massacre in Australia was in 1938, the Coniston Massacre. This memorial complexifies that information, and it's enough information to give people the agency they need to become involved in justice. Peter Coleman's other point is that we need to harness intense emotions of violent conflict. He says it's really important to find a way to work our way through them so that people can use that energy and use that emotion to turn towards effecting change to creating initiatives together that are going to make a difference. In intense and intractable conflict, you can just think of some of the emotional experiences that people might have, as Aboriginal people had, that people after uh, genocides might experience. A lot of times those emotions are so intense that people cannot find a way to express them. And then they find themselves losing their solidarity losing their ability to mourn, they find themselves separated from each other. Performances can bring them back together again in solidarity to express those emotions in ways that help them move forward together. This is a performance that was put on in the former Yugoslavia by Da Theater, which formed just in the beginning days of the war. The story is told by Diana Milosevic, who's one of the co-founders of Da Theater. This particular performance is called Maps of Forbidden Remembrance. It's about the 8,000 Muslim men and boys who were massacred in Srebrenica. Diana talks about them performing this play on the streets of Belgrade. She says, we were forbidden by our government to speak about what had happened. We weren't supposed to name a single one of these. And there were armed soldiers around us. But by doing this, she says, we created a place to mourn. We created a place to come together, 
and to begin to disrupt this violent system. They also went on to perform this play a little bit later in Mostar, Bosnia, one of the places that experienced the worst atrocities during the war. And Diana says, because we were Serbs ourselves and we were willing to admit our complicity, our country's complicity in this violence, she said it went a long way for the people living in Mostar to be able to release their bitterness. They could see that we empathized with them and we could begin to form more just relationships. Another aspect that these rituals and ceremonies do very well is restore multidimensionality to polarized identities. One of the first, this, and this is the Two Rivers powwow, which I'll tell you about in a moment. One of the first fallouts, or one of the first adverse conditions that comes out of escalating conflict is that people before knew each other in a range of ways. You're many things. You, you relate with us in many different ways. You have many different aspects. But when violent conflict erupts, you are now the axis of evil. You're now the enemy. We are the ones on the side of justice. So you can imagine in this land, after 300 years, between Native Americans and settler Americans, what kinds of very rigid identities may have been formed. And I'm going to describe how they were disrupted through this performance in Twisp, Washington. This is a Twisp Valley. And settlers and Methow Indians and other Native elders came together there to say, what can we do about changing this? You know, right now, most of the people, speaking of these polarized identities, most of the people in this valley that live in this valley, no Native Americans there, say either there were no Native Americans there, or we have a non-existent people, or they vanished. Okay, they're all gone now. We don't know what happened to them, but they're all gone. So you have a vanishing race, which you see, unfortunately, a lot in our poetry, our American poetry that gets read in elementary schools and high schools. The Methow Indians were not vanished. They had been removed by the United States Army in 1886 at gunpoint. And the ones who survived lived in a reservation about an hour's drive away. Some of the people there said, really, I, I don't think this is, I don't think we can live justly if we say, well, they never existed or they're gone. So they invited some of the Methow people in. Now, the Methow people also had a very polarized and rigid enemy. They say, wait a minute, why would we want to go over there and talk to those people living in the Twist Valley? They already have everything. They took the land. They took our culture, took our language, put us in boarding schools. They've got everything. There's no point in talking to them. So we have this tension between the victors, the vanquishers, and the vanished. But it wasn't good enough for some of these people, and they came together through shared ritual and ceremony, shared meals of traditional foods of the Methow people, drumming, dancing, giveaway ceremonies. And now they see themselves in much richer identities. You're the person who's willing to change your whole career so that you can come and support the Methow nation. Oh, you're the people who worked and made a legal agreement so that we can come back on your land and gather our roots and traditional vegetables without being driven away at gunpoint. It's what happened to us previously. So we have relationships and images of each other as relational. In fact, some of the Methow elders have held formal ceremonies where some of the settler people have been formally adopted into their nation. And the final point I want to talk about is the way in which performances, ceremonies, and rituals can disrupt feedback loops for conflict systems. Peter Coleman explains that when we get to the stage where conflict's intractable, it's not shifting. Many initiatives have taken place to try to shift that conflict, to transform it, to end it. Nothing's happening. It's violent. It keeps growing bigger, drawing in more people. And he says, it works like a, a conflict, it works like a natural system in that one feedback loop tends to exacerbate the other. So if you, you get one element of this conflict activated, it's going to exacerbate the others. Now, one of the elements in intractable conflict is a culture of impunity. People are not receiving significant kinds of justice in relationship to the atrocities that they've committed. This is a performance, a series of performances, actually, held in Argentina. Roberto Varela recounts this story. 
These performances are designed to disrupt a culture of impunity. This group called EHOS, the Sons and Daughters for Identity and Justice and Against Forgetting and Silence, they go to the doorsteps of the homes of people who were members of the former dictatorship. These members who were never tried or they were pardoned. Society's running on as if nothing has happened and the people in these performance are saying, that's not good enough. We're going to stand in front of your house and we're going to read out what your crimes were. We're going to read out your atrocities. These are called escraches. And Roberto says that these performances have disrupted the government narratives. They tend to say, yes, justice has been implemented. And instead, they bring forth a new form of revitalized memory amongst the populace. This is something that happened that still needs to be redressed. It brings about solidarity. And it brings about, even as they're working towards measure, measures of retributive justice, it brings about symbolic and restorative justice. And I'm going to close with a quote from Solomon Lerner Febres, who was the president of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Peru. He says, art is a powerful enemy of the injustice of forgetting. It's in instances like these that art is not just contemplation and transcendence, but also a form of justice that cleanses and vindicates our species in a universal way. I give a deepest thanks and gratitude to all of the artists and cultural workers who've put their life on the line to transform these kinds of violent conflict. Thank you.